Right, awesome. I know it gives me like five seconds of, of Zoho things. So if you saw me staring blankly for a, for a moment, I apologize. That was me. Hello, good morning. Well, for me, it's morning. Uh, but uh, I'm Joey Sonart. Welcome to IDTX. Uh, and today we got James Gilchrist. Is, did I say that name right? Gilchrist? Christ. Yes, thank you. Perfect. All right, it's awesome. Um, who's doing a, uh, who's going to be doing a little bit of a talk on kind of one of my favorites, uh, favorite concepts, which is storytelling and the art of engagement. I'm very much a storyteller myself. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm keeping this one short. He's going to share a little bit about kind of the user interface and whatnot, but just letting everybody know there's not really a chat feature in Zoho, but there is a Q and a section. So uh, I think he's going to guide you to that. Um, and I will, uh, I'll leave it over to him. James, take this one away. Okay, thank you so much, Joey. I appreciate that. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is my first IDTX conference. I don't know if it's yours, but uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to storytelling and the art of engagement. Before we begin, I'll outline what you can expect from this session. If this is your first Zoho hosted webinar, notice that you should have a floating actions menu that you can click and drag anywhere you like. Take special note of the question mark icon. It's labeled Q&A when you hover over it, and you'll be able to click on that to open a panel where you'll be able to enter comments and ask questions throughout the session. I will also be available for questions to chat about the session or anything L&D in the sessions tab on the IDTX conference site after we finish. My primary objective for this session is to encourage a discussion about becoming what I like to call engagement managers. I'll talk about the importance of storytelling, imagery, and metaphors when used in learning solution development I'll also show you how the provided characters, backgrounds, and role play functionality in iSpring Suite can be used to generate interactive and engaging context-driven scenarios for your learners. Please know that I encourage you to ask questions and comment via the Q&A. Your active participation will help create a more compelling and engaging session. See what I did there? Lastly, and most importantly, Thank you for joining. It is always my first intention to be of service. My dream is to assist as many clients and learning specialists as I can. Thanks also to Tom, the hosts, presenters, and everyone helping to make IDTX a great learning experience. Finally, a shout out to Nadia Spellman, community manager at iSpring Solutions, with whom I enjoyed talking through this presentation but who unfortunately isn't able to attend today. And I'm seeing your applause and your, uh, your emoticons floating up on the screen. And uh, I just wanna say thanks for that. It's a, it's a bit early here in Denver, Colorado and uh, any little endorphin boost I can get at this point to go with my coffee is a, is a good thing. So I won't spend too much time on who I am because I'd rather engage with you, but it may be useful to know a bit about my background because after all, context is king. So while I am currently providing learning and development services to a variety of clients as the director of Lighthouse L&D Consulting, before that, I spent over 20 years creating instructor-led and online training, managing teams of instructional designers, sales reps, and customer service reps, and managing a variety of learning programs at many different companies. Corporate learning environments are where I've spent my career. I've specialized in the financial services sector with the occasional mobile tech startup, system as a service, and employer services organizations thrown in. On the slide, you can see my LinkedIn header. I always emphasize human-centric, and learner-driven solutions, no matter what format or technology is currently in fashion. I believe that if learning designers are fully supported, empowered to believe in themselves and their creativity, encouraged to learn all they can about their learners, 
their user story, workflow, and work environment, they will be able to develop truly engaging and most importantly, truly effective learning solutions. My hope is that everyone attending this session or watching it later will take away from it my encouragement and belief in what you are capable of. Scan the QR code to connect with me on LinkedIn. Let me know if there's anything I can ever do for you or if you'd like a sounding board for any aspect of any project you're working on. To quote one of my favorite DevLearn conference slogans, together we are better. Here I've put forth the premise for your consideration. Give me a yes in the Q&A panel if you agree, or give me a no and a why not if you don't. If the objective of instruction or training is the effective transfer of knowledge and applicable skills to the learner, then we as designers are obligated to use the most effective means to facilitate that transfer with our learning solutions. Let's talk about what some of those effective means are. Whether you primarily create solutions aimed at higher ed, industry, or corporate audiences, to name just a few, some common denominators are that your learner has a brain like you, values their time, and don't have as much of it as they'd like, and respond to emotional stimuli and rewards. They may stop scrolling at the sight of different things than you, but they enjoy seeing things they like, and they understand the concept of risk. I'd like to invite you to th think of yourself as having been given a new, new and very important title, that of an engagement manager. A new title may help you think a bit differently about the importance of engaging your learners. In addition to your responsibilities as an instructional designer, your new role requires you to evaluate all new learning solutions from from the perspective of the learner. Your, your primary measurement of success is how effectively a learning solution transfers skills and decision-making abilities. Your, your learning program participants must effectively demonstrate their new skills and abilities. And I invite you to ask yourself if thinking of yourself as an engagement manager, ultimately responsible for your learner's ability to perform new tasks and make informed decisions long after they complete their training represents a shift in your thinking. And I just wanna give a shout out to Krista Schneider for saying yes, agreeing with the premise on the previous slide. Thank you for that. And Kyron, very thank you. Next, we'll look at how the use of storytelling imagery and metaphors can increase engagement and improve learning transfer. The TV, film, and theater we love most all have in common great stories with three-dimensional characters. The greatest stories, the ones we remember best, see their characters go on journeys that really make us feel something. Journeys, feeling something, and remembering. These three things, when applied to learning and development, have a significant positive impact on learning teams, learning solutions, and learning culture. When you add narrative and context to your learning, you'll find that knowledge retention is better than ever before. These characteristics lead to higher level critical thinking on the part of your learners, crucial to knowing what choices to make make in real world scenarios and to exercising sound judgment. Joseph Campbell, author of The Hero's Journey and a must read. Read said people forget facts, but they remember stories. Seeing these images of Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson from the iconic Rob Reiner, Aaron Sorkin film, A Few Good Men, brings instant recollection of this moment for those who've taken the training, I mean, seen the movie. So much so that most of us immediately hear Jack Nicholson's words echoing through the courtroom when we do. Do you remember the quote? You can't handle the truth. Hopefully that resonated for some of you. If you ever have any 
any doubts about the effectiveness good storytelling has on our ability to remember words of importance, just think of this scene. Yes, Krista, she got it. Awesome. Uh, at any point, feel free to let me know in the Q&A one way you think great storytelling could promote real change in your organization or for your learners. And if you're someone who hasn't seen A Few Good Men, I really encourage you to watch it because it's a great pick and I love Aaron Sorkin. Um, but if you, and if you haven't, hopefully there is a movie or a play or some book in that you've read or, or watched or seen that has a, moments like this in it. Ones which immediately come to mind when you think of them, because that's the point to this. So, Lainey Rosenswig, Accelerated Resolution Therapy founder, says, images are the significant contributing factor to the problem symptoms caused by post-traumatic stress disorder. Once the images from the trauma are removed, the facts do not trigger the symptoms and those symptoms are abated. I have included this quote by Accelerated Resolution Therapy founder, Lainey Rosenzweig, because of its profound importance, not only to the health and well-being of trauma sufferers everywhere, but to our role as engagement managers. Few things are given as much power by our own minds as images. For those of you who are not yet familiar with ART, it represents a fundamental shift in the way trauma can be treated by licensed therapists who are now able to significantly reduce or even eliminate entirely the once lasting impact that traumatic experiences have on those who've experienced them. Think about that. By eliminating certain images from a client's view, once seemingly permanent problems can be made to disappear while preventing future trigger situations. Talk about affecting a positive behavioral change. We also know from neurological studies that the brain processes most of the images you see with the lateral occipital complex, or LOC, a part of the brain located in the outward portion of the occipital lobe. But faces have a whole region of the brain dedicated to recognizing them. This is called the fusiform face area. The FFA thinks about objects in a holistic way, processing the perceived relationships between the parts that make up the face. We are so practiced at recognizing faces that we can imagine we see faces when viewing non-facial objects whose spatial relationships can stand in for the expected parts of a face. Our understanding of facial-spatial relationships lets us identify people just by looking at their faces. So, when faced with the image of a person's face about whom we've been given a compelling story, with whom, oh, pardon me, folks. I, besides, I get to say the pun again. So, when faced with the image of a person's face about whom we've been given a compelling story, with whom we've gone on a journey, and who is expressing a strong emotion, we are biologically programmed to file this information away along with the details of the story and the outcome of any interaction we've had with them. Powerful reasons for including storytelling and imagery, especially facial imagery in our learning solutions. So where do metaphors come in? The use of analogies and metaphors in learning programs can have a powerful impact on a learner's understanding of new or complex concepts. They highlight the similarities between knowledge we already have and that which we are trying to learn. Analogies and metaphors create a scaffold in the learner's mind, allowing new information to be added on top. Our minds are masterful at organizing information as we are constantly faced with new experiences and new awareness. It may not seem like it when you find it hard to recall something, but often, if you can tap into a related memory, the one you are trying to recall pops in. As engagement managers, we should incorporate metaphors to help learners take new information and contextualize it with the information they already have. 
best if the information relates to the environment at hand or some previous learning requirement. But failing this, a metaphor based on a common experience can be very powerful. Imagine describing a team of frustrated employees like a pot of water about to boil. An immediate understanding of the consequences of not removing the pot from the metaphorical heat is had. What about describing the current state of a complicated enterprise resource planning system as that of a log jammed river? Apt indeed, if the production planners are not approving their raw material requisitions in a timely manner. Metaphors may seem like the purview of fiction writers, but their effectiveness at conveying complex ideas simply and succinctly cannot be overstated. Remember, your learners have lots to do in little time. Engaging them with wordplay that helps them quickly uptake new concepts and ideas will be appreciated. At this point, I'm going to talk about using iSpring to create engaging learner stories. So I'm going to stop the slideshow and I'm going to show you the PowerPoint deck and the iSpring deck, uh, excuse me, and the iSpring uh, menu bar so we can do a little bit of a deep dive. So now, now you should be seeing my PowerPoint with the role play slide selected. Can anybody give me a thumbs up just to make sure that uh, everybody's seeing what I expect you to see? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the thumbs up. Okay, so um, yay, lots of thumbs up. Right back at you. Uh, so I mentioned that I worked with Nadia Spellman um, when I began putting this presentation together. Uh, She's someone I've known a long time who works at iSpring Solutions. Um, how many people, I think we've got over 60 people in the session right now, have used iSpring uh, in the past specifically? Give me a thumbs up. That's That works just, just so I have some idea. If you've used iSpring or from, are familiar with it, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Okay, so we've got we got one thumb. Okay, two thumbs, a few more thumbs. Okay, well, iSpring is a wonderful e-learning creation tool, and it just gets better all the time. I've been using it since it was offered uh, in a form called iSpring Presenter version five on a, um, a website that I recommend uh, called giveawayoftheday.com, where you can go and every day they offer up a new piece of software that you can download with a license for free. It might be uh, that License might be good forever, it might be good for a year, it might be good for six months, but it's a great place to check out new tools. So I discovered iSpring that way. Um, and what I liked best about it was the fact that it would allow me to use it the way I wanted to use it. And when it came to publishing some pretty unorthodox presentations, um, micro websites, all kinds of things, it never broke. You know, um, early in the days of content creation tools, especially the e-learning content creation tools, you'd sometimes have issues with audio or uh, the program crashing when you try to launch it. Anybody remember when Captivate wasn't able to produce uh, audio of this sort of compressed staticky sound to it. I'm going way back. Captivate is an awesome tool. No slight to anybody at Adobe or Captivate. I use it. But it's just an example of a particular problem that, you know, forced me to have to look elsewhere to do the audio part of my Captivate output, just so everything looked and, and sounded as good as I wanted it to. Um, so iSpring is a tool that works as a plugin to PowerPoint, Microsoft PowerPoint. And I'm demonstrating this on a Windows PC. Um, and you can see that right here, we're looking at the uh, toolbar for uh, for PowerPoint. And you'll notice there are a couple of things in here that are specific to some additional plugins that I have plugged in. You can see Articulate is in here and there's a few other things. But if you look up here at where it says iSpring Suite 11 and you click on that, now all of the controls across the top 
of your interface are available to you. And these are all specific to iSpring. Um, and usually what happens it, when you work in iSpring is that you click on something, uh, one of these menu options, and it actually opens up a new interface. So I'm gonna do that um, as we look at this role play that I've created. And uh, if it pops up on another screen, cause I've got a lot, I'll try to drag it back into view. Um, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at a slide that iSpring creates for you to represent an object that is a role-playing object. Uh, Talkmaster is actually the application made by iSpring that handles the role-playing scenario. Um, and in order for me to go in and actually make changes to what we're looking at here, this is just a static slide, I have to go up here to where it says role-play and click on that. So I'm going to do that so we can get sort of peel back the curtain and see see what's happening behind the scenes. Um, um, has anybody ever used a tool called Prezi? Give me a thumbs up if you have, if that means something to you. Prezi is a tool that lets you create, yeah, lots of thumbs up, nice. Prezi is a tool that lets you create, oh, a lot of thumbs, cool. Prezi is a tool that lets you create uh, an interactive, uh, an interactive presentation that is rather non-linear. Um, and you, you, when you're using Prezi, you get this a screen kind of like this. And instead of creating slides in a deck like PowerPoint, you create objects and, and images and videos and you drop them into this big freewheeling open space and you can control the order that that content appears. But while it's happening, you're sort of zooming in and out. Well, anyway, I mentioned that because when I first saw this storytell, uh, this talk master interface, um, I was reminded of that. What's really cool about this particular function is how easy it, it, it iSpring makes it to create branching scenarios. Um, and you can move your content by just clicking and dragging anywhere you want. Um, so you can just, you can make this thing as big and as complex as you need it to be. And e it's easy to find any element of it all at once. Um, so up here in the toolbar that you see in Talkmaster, you can see where you can create a new scene. And that's what these numbered items are. And they're, they're numbered so that you can better find their content when you go into edit mode. Um, you can choose yourself what color you want the scenes to be um, in the software, which can help you when you're organizing, you know, groups of conversations and their replies together. Um, is Talkmaster only in iSpring? Thank you, Winona. Um, I believe that Talkmaster is built into the iSpring suite, and it isn't something that you can use separately. Um, it's a fantastic tool. And um, iSpring Max, uh, iSpring Suite Max, which gives you access to an extensive library of characters and backgrounds, which I'm going to show you in a minute, um, is incredibly valuable and makes the process of creating scenarios really easy. Um, so I just saw my video go away. So can someone just give me a thumbs up and let me know? Can you still see my screen and hear me? Okay, thanks. Okay. So I don't know what happened to my video, but there must be a bandwidth issue. So I'll, but as long as you can see, see my screen and hear me, I'll keep going. Awesome. I appreciate. Yeah, exactly. Winona, you can hear me, but not see my face. I, I don't know why that is. Um, let me see if that makes a difference. Okay. Hey, I think I'm back. Okay. Great. Thanks, Winona. Um, so I was, uh, Hopefully I answered that question about Talkmaster um, and iSpring Suite. Um, and um, so, so before I dive in to edit one of these scenes or talk about how you can make scenes, let's just quickly recap. Why is it that you want to include scenarios role-playing uh, actions and so forth in your e-learning content because it's how you can create a story for your learner 
to get engaged in. It's different than simply presenting them with facts uh, or presenting, you know, data. Um, it's like the difference between your CEO coming into the room and simply putting up a slide that shows you the uh, the financial metrics for the per current quarter and then walking out of the room or coming into the room and telling everybody a great story about how the company was able to overcome obstacles, find their way to the, to the right product and start delivering it to their customers, resulting in the numbers that you see here, right? The second is much more compelling. It makes you feel invested, et cetera. So in case you're not following how we got from storytelling to this, um, that's, that's why we're here. Um, now I am going to, um, I'm going to left click on one of these scenes so you can start to see what you can edit behind the scenes, if you will. Um, you'll notice that you can choose from the content tab, the images tab, and the properties. The properties is where you select the color. So this only matters when you're looking at stuff on the back end. Uh, I happen to chose this magenta color. For images, you can choose a character and a background. So if you click on the character, you can see it opens up uh, a window showing you examples of characters that are built in to the program. And you can also add content from the content library. Um, and there are many, many, many hundreds of characters. One of the things that's really fantastic about iSpring is literally how many different characters they give you. Now notice these characters most of them look like they are from some kind of a business setting. We do have a few sort of uh, first responders, um, some uh, perhaps a construction worker, that sort of thing. But this is just a very small sample of what you can see when you click on the add from content library. Um, not only that, but each of the characters have um, a huge assortment of poses and emotional reactions. One of the things that I found frustrating when I would try to create scenarios using other tools was that I always felt like I was bumping up against a limit. I couldn't find the person or the character or the expression or the pose that I really wanted. And so if this is interesting to you, you should definitely look into iSpring and uh, for the value of their content library. Over here under the icon, uh, the, the thumbnail of the character we've selected, notice that here where we've selected him, there's a, uh, he looks like he's, um, he doesn't have the same expression that he has over here. This is showing as unhappy. And we can change that simply by clicking on these little smiley faces, right? Um, and for the background, um, I was writing a story about uh, an e-learning developer who comes to work early to try and catch up on his work. And so I found a picture that shows him arriving at the elevators. So he's arriving in the morning. Now, again, you can see there are built in a great number of backgrounds from all different kinds of locations. So you've got uh, homes, businesses, outdoor places, um, like a lot of things that look like they're in a mall. Again, on its face, these might appear to be a rather small selection. I, it's easy to think that there might be options that you want that you don't see here. But if you go to the add from content library, um, and I'm clicking on it, and I'm hoping it's going to show up on the screen in front of you, right. So now you can see that far beyond the items that are built in, you have many, many, many more. With another really great session. And oh, pardon me. You will find a poll in the polling tab. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, design principles session started playing in the background because, of course, I'm I'm in IDTX as well as presenting at IDTX. So I apologize if that audio interrupted us. Um, so notice that you've got photo backgrounds, but you've also got some illustrations, and you can click on uh, the arrow that expand the area and get even more to choose from. You can do a search, you can look for illustrations, photos, 3D, etc. 
So this is just one example of how many different kinds of options that are available to you. So you can construct the scene that contextually matches the story that you're trying to tell, okay? Um, I'm gonna give a quick walkthrough of the scenario I created, but before I do, I wanna show you, here's an example of a background that I created and uploaded. And it's, it's not actually a picture uh, of a, of a you know, it's not a background like a physical location, but it's an email. I created an email and turned it into a picture so that when it came time in the scenario for the character to um, to be talking about some, an event he's not happy with, you're actually seeing the email in the background. So I thought that was pretty clever that iSpring gives you the ability to upload and use anything you want. You don't have to use the characters that are included. You don't have to use the backgrounds that are included. You can import anything you want into the scene builder and you'll be able to use it. So uh, hopefully that makes sense and that that's gives you some insight. Um, oh, I chose the, <laughs> I clicked on that. So let me go back to our elevators, hit close. Okay, content. Now in, in the content area, you can choose to enter a message or you can enter a reply. Now, replies are typically um, things that the user clicks on in order to make a choice and be taken to another scene. Um, and messages are, I think, useful if you want to include some kind of a narration. Okay. So in addition to the characters talking, you have a narrator, which for my, for my purposes, I, I recorded my own voice to narrate the script. Um, and then I used iSpring's text to speech functionality so that I could have a variety of voices that provided the, uh, the voices of all the characters. So, uh, we'll take a look at that. I see a question, Dominica in the chat. Um, do they have multiple facial expressions? Yes. The answer is yes. There are quite a few, the, there, I would say there's between 75 and a hundred different poses and facial expressions for each one of the characters. Um, when you think about that number, and then you think about how many different characters there are, it, they are really doing everything they can to give you a robust solution that's gonna allow you to create customized role-playing scenarios that don't keep using the same people, right? Because if you saw the same person talking in every one of your simulations for every one of your courses, that would get old pretty quick, right? Okay, um, so up here, you can choose to preview the entire scene, or if you open up and have a scene selected, you can choose preview from this scene. Well, I happen to choose the first one, so I'm gonna, uh, I just wanted to show you that you had that option. So you don't have to watch the whole scenario every time you wanna edit a scene, you can jump right into one scene. Um, but I'm gonna say preview from the beginning. Uh, now, I'm going to turn down my speakers because I don't know that the audio is going to come through. But basically, um, you, what you're seeing here is an example of a message. So I typed in what I wanted to appear on the slide. And when the slide begins, the user is hearing my voice read this caption. And we're talking about Bill, who's an instructional designer. Now, I think there must be a way for you to customize what these buttons show up as, but I think it's in the iSpring interface itself. It's not in the Talk Master. I thought, honestly, if anybody's done this or used this and knows how to change this from saying, say, start to next um, in Talk Master, go ahead and say yes in the, in the Q&A. Um, that's something I'm gonna find out about. The user would click on that and they would be taken to another scene. Now you can see an example. My background is this email I created. The character is uh, using a different expression and a different pose. And the message is, again, read by the narrator, me. And it says, when Bill gets to his desk, he finds an email from his manager advising him of a proposal deadline for the end of the day today that he forgot to mention until almost nine o'clock last night, which is why we've got the email in the background. So you would hit continue, and now you can see I've chosen a different location and the character with a slightly less annoyed face who's decided he's going to go on with his day. And again, the audio is being provided by me. And at this point, he runs into his 
manager's boss. And Claire is basically dropping an entirely a third project on him. So he's already behind on one. He's been asked late last night to do something else. And now as he walks through his office, he gets stopped and told, you know, there's something else he needs to go do. So here's the point where we get to what is Bill going to do? At this point, Bill is pretty frustrated between feeling behind the late night request and now this new surprise project coming from his manager's boss. His stomach is in knots. Hit continue. And now we hear the narrator say, should Bill? And then you get these choices. So he can choose to tell Claire that he doesn't have time for that now, but he'll get to it later, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to read all of these options but what's important to know is that based on which op option the user chooses they get taken to a scene a branching scene that allows them to experience the repercussions of that so let's say uh he let's say bill decides to tell claire he doesn't have time for that now but he'll get to it later so we click that and now we see Claire saying, I'm really surprised at that answer, Bill. I wouldn't have asked you if it wasn't important. So the scene goes on and on. It's got lots of different branching scenarios. Notice that up here, you can choose to see how your scenario, when it's inside your project and gets published to either a tablet or a phone uh, and is viewed in either uh, portrait or landscape mode, you can see how it's going to look. And they even give you what is essentially uh, a finger, right? So you can interface or interact with things using this. So you can see how they would be inter interacting with the content. Something really great to know about iSpring is how well it works when you are publishing content for the web or for mobile. Everything is fully responsive um, and it's very easy to use. So if I close that um, and I close this, I'm going to go to that scene. So this is where Claire says, I'm really surprised at that answer, Bill. I click on that. And now you can see you have the choice to add replies or add a message. Add replies would be how we would put those multiple choice op options onto the scenario slide. And we would then branch to another result based on that. A message would be this right here, which is what Claire is saying in response to Bill's outlandish statement. Um, so that's the difference between replies and message. Um, with that scene selected, I'm going to show you um, the, the voiceover screen. So the voiceover screen shows you all of the messages or replies that have had an audio file attached to them. If it has an audio file attached to it, you'll see a little play icon here. If it doesn't have an audio file, you'll see an option to record an audio file, or you can import an audio file. Um, now, now, I mentioned iSpring has a text-to-speech function, and the text-to-speech function gives you access to a lot of different voices, and they keep adding voices all the time. Now, I don't know about you. Um, tell me with a thumbs up or thumbs down in the chat um, what your experience is with using AI voices. Um, but in the past, especially if I've had a rather complex project or scenario that I was trying to narrate, um, I found the lack of an AI, uh, an AI's ability to emphasize the important concepts and the new information as the text goes on to be a bit of a distraction. Um, I had a client that had for whom, okay, we, I've seen a thumbs up. So go ahead and tell me in the, in the Q and a, what you love most about AI voices. Um, I know for me, the advantage of an AI voice is that it allows me to script something and have it presented to someone in say a storyboard very quickly. I can make changes, et cetera, and not have to worry about everything sounding exactly the same. But in the end, I tend to fall more on, yes, yes, thank you, Dominica. They're quick and flexible, but they lack emotion, right? And think about what we've been talking about. For my purposes, if what we're trying to do is create a compelling story, 
where the character has uh, an emotional journey and we're trying to invest the learner in that journey, anything you can do that's, that is going to translate to the feeling of an emotion, I am obligated to do. You know, I'm not going to fall back on AI just because it makes my job easier if it means that in the end, the learner's experience isn't as good as it could be, or they couldn't, they might wind up not feeling attached. I mean, it's kind of difficult to feel attached to a robot. So <laughs> whatever your thoughts are about AI, that's where I come down on using voices. But for the purposes of creating some of the different characters, like I'm, I'm a guy, uh, uh, and I'm happy to do narration, but I think it's going to be more interesting for cat for my learners to hear, uh, male and female voices, for example, and lots of different voices because it brings the characters to life, right? If you had the same voice for everything, that wouldn't be good. Um, but the, uh, so let me just click quickly on, um, I'll click on the record button just so you can see the interface so you can literally just hit record and record something and then you can edit it um and it even pulls in the text that you dropped into that particular scene so you have something to read from right so that's really convenient right um you have the ability to edit if you select something that's already been recorded now this is just the word should bill but if i hit the edit button let me drag this interface back in front of you you can see you get a waveform you can use uh, a noise reduction setting if your uh, recording conditions aren't perfect um, you can adjust the volume of the overall volume of your clip so that you can make sure that they all are about the same you can preview it, play it, et cetera. You can add a fade in, fade out. You can trim. So if I select the text like this, like say I've got a lot of empty space at the beginning and at the end, you can click trim and it's gonna get rid of that very easily. And you can also, if it's a long phrase and there's something in the middle that you want to not cut, but to silence, you can do that with the silence button. Then you hit save and close and it drops you right back into your editor. So now I am a big fan and have long used a program called Audacity. If anyone is else in the on this call has used Audacity to edit audio, give me a thumbs up. Um, but it's free. It's a great program. It's got noise reduction. It's always been something I've relied on to be able to thank you for the thumbs up to to be able to bring audio into my projects. Um, but I find the audio handling of the iSpring suite solution to be very good in other words whatever you put into it is what you're going to get it doesn't apply compression if you don't want it to it doesn't change the quality of the audio and again to keep someone in an immersive engaging ex emotional rift, rich experience i think the audio is important um, up here you can see you have the option to import import a voiceover from uh another file uh and what I'm gonna do is show you how I use the text-to-speech option to create an audio file that I can drop into my scenario. So I'm gonna close voiceover mode and I'm going to return to my course. And back in my course, you can see the next slide in my presentation, I've set up as a work slide. It's a sample text-to-speech slide, basically, because iSpring lets you record voiceover narration for any slide, in addition to going into TalkMaster and creating role plays, you can go straight into um, manage narration from the iSpring suite toolbar. And, and it's going to open up a new window, the iSpring narration editor. And, and this is a fabulous tool too. Uh, because it allows you all these yellow vertical lines to a slide, a recorded audio to a slide. I can watch the slide play in real time and just drag these little yellow vertical lines to where the action that corresponds to what is being said occurs. Um, very easy to edit. 
uh, highly recommended. But here we are on slide 14, and we've got slide notes over here. And um, so if I, if I click on the audio button and I say text to speech, I can insert the text from my notes. So here's the text that I've dropped into the notes for this slide. And then I can choose a voice. Now I've chosen Helen for Claire, but look at all of these different voices. Okay. And know that after you, um, after you choose a voice, you can also make some edits. So in other words, if it doesn't sound quite as good as you'd like, you can make edits to it after the fact, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say, um, insert. And I'm going to insert it at the beginning of the slide. And you can see that now this is the waveform that of the audio that was created by using the text to speech. So now this is an audio file. So now that I have this audio file, um, I'm going to save and close. Actually, wait, uh, edit clip. Yes, here we go. So I open up the audio file that the text to speech just created. And I can export this audio file. And it's going to allow me to save a, an MP3 anywhere I want on my computer. So once I've exported that audio file, I, I can go back to my scenario and I can go into role play and I can go to the scene for which I have just created an audio file based on text to speech. I go into voiceover and I can click on this import folder and I can bring that audio file in. So all of that is just to demonstrate um, how easy it is to work with not only recording right in iSpring, any audio you want, but being able to bring in audio that's been generated by its text to speech. Um, finally, something that I think is incredibly useful is that if you have a reply for a scene that you've already written, and you need to create a new uh, a new scene that is what is where the learner goes when they click on that reply in that scenario. All you have to do in this view is left click on the actual reply and just start dragging. And you can see when you let go, it creates a new scene. So can if you can you imagine if you scripted out a complex scenario with lots of replies and branching options and so forth. Can you, hopefully you can see how quickly you could build it using this tool because you literally are looking at the layout of all of your different scenes. You can see which ones are connected to which. And when you need a new answer or a new result, you just click literally on the numbered reply, drag, and it opens up a new window for you to start creating a new scene. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop there and just ask in the questions if, um, if there's anything that I've shown you so far, tell me in the Q&A that you want me to maybe spend a little more time on or talk about a little bit more. Um, because we're getting about to the point where I wanted to leave some time for people to ask questions. But before I duck out of iSpring, I figured if you have questions, go ahead and ask. Or give me a thumbs up if this feels like a tool that you can see creatively using for your own learners to create interactive and engaging scenarios. We've got a thumbs up. I'm glad of that. Oh, I'm sorry. I hadn't scrolled down in the Q and A. Okay. Um, I like knowing. Okay. So, so Tom McDowell. Oh, thanks, Tom. Tom says, I like not knowing that a voice is not tied 
to a uh, hire tie to hire if i need to update content i don't have to worry about it if i have access oh so this is the you're answering the question about using ai and voiceover yes absolutely if you have access to ai and you can use it consistently it does save you the trouble of having to make a change to of course long after that actor is no longer around um and winona agrees um yes oh dominic i'm so glad you asked about other languages are supported they are supported this is an actually i have a slide at the end of this presentation with resource links that will figure out some way to get to folks um there is a translation option now what's interesting is that when you choose to translate um your scenarios into multiple languages uh it, it's not that ispring does the translating what iSpring lets you do is export a tech, uh, export a particular kind of file that you can then import into a program like Crowdian. Uh, Crowdian um, lets you upload the exported file, which includes, as you, you can see here, um, all of these sentences that are. are spoken um you can upload that file and then you can choose a language here i chose german and then select um hopefully all if you're converting an entire scenario into another language um which one you want to see converted and um here you can see i i said for practice purposes i uploaded my file that i exported from ispring to crowd in and i said translate this snippet that i checked on the left into german and it gave me a series of results over here on the right and then i went through the various options and i picked the one that i wanted and i approved it by clicking on this little icon which turns it to a check mark then in this program crowd in you can download that file then you upload that file back into ispring and using the um, import text. And for your entire project and all the scenes, all of what is seen on the screen will be changed to a different language. Now, if you are narrating, that is obviously not going to help you um, with your audio. So you need to use another option to change all of the audio files into that being spoken by, um, you know, a native German speaker or something like that. Um, but because you can import audio, you can, you could, if you use another tool in order to get your AI, for example, languages, uh, other than the one that you wrote it in, you can bring those back in. So again, pretty powerful and pretty flexible. Um, and all of the output that when you, when you save this scene and return to the course, basically you go back into powerpoint and even though what this appears to be is just like a static slide if i were to publish this entire presentation that i've given today when we got to this role play essentially instead of a slide with its own play bar etc navigation and script and uh, outline and so forth it would be as if you had entered an entirely new presentation inside your presentation. So you can choose to publish these role-playing scenarios as standalone objects with no other slides around them and drop them into your LMS or use them as, you know, as they are by themselves. Um, or you could put a bunch of scenarios into a single PowerPoint presentation and then publish them all and they would, you know, play one after the other. Um, but it, it's really impressive that it basically takes all of that behind the scenes content and rip, boils it down to this static slide so you can see where it appears in the rest of your presentation. Um, and as, it, as such, yes, they play when uploaded to Moodle. They play anywhere, uh, any LMS uh, that, you know, is HTML5 based, essentially, um, they're going to play. So thank you very much for those questions about languages being in, and how you upload your content. Um, so any questions about what I was saying with regards to using characters, how you would bring them into your scenario, how you would bran create branching scenarios, how you use audio for either your own voice or a recorded 
voice that you import or using text to speech, you know, anything at all about anything that I've talked about at this point, um, you know, I'm happy to uh, happy to talk about. Let's see here. Okay. Um, it's 913. Our session is going to end in just a couple of minutes. Um, I know quite a few folks um, dropped to see, uh, I'm assuming another the presentation as this one was uh, underway. Um, I am going to make myself available in the IDTX session area if anyone wants to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, oh, I'm so sorry my video is turned off again. Oh, I apologize for that. I don't know why that just uh, keeps turning itself off. It might be bandwidth issues. Um, but I do apologize for probably a lot of that walkthrough uh, in the iSpring application. You weren't seeing me. Um, and uh, so at this point, I'll just say thank you to everyone um, for attending. Thank you to Tom and IDTX for the session. And uh, like I said, I'll see if I can't get um, a PDF of this presentation made available on the site. And uh, I'll be sharing these links to all kinds of related issues, websites where you can get images, uh, crowd in, et cetera. Thanks, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining. Um, and yeah, thank you, James. This was this was awesome. I, I was listening in. I was like, oh, I appreciate it. So uh, yeah, as far as video stuff, I think it's just bandwidth. Uh, but this will this will be able to record. The video was still working just fine. So I was able to see that. Um, so yeah, thank you for putting it all together. OK. All right, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful time attending all the other sessions at IDTX. And uh, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn. Cheers, everybody.